This is your Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live, as always, from BBG Towers here in, in, in Salford. Why did I have to think about that? Because I'm trying to do three things at the same time. Yes, I'm dragging a tune in. I'm dragging a tune into the playout system. I'm checking if Tony is there. You see, there's no producer here to do all of this. Do you want the job, do you, do you? Do you, do you come cheap, do you? Um, keep those comments coming in. Live comment, richieallen.co.uk. And uh, as I said, I will read more out later on. Blue Oyster Cult, then Tony Gosling. Don't fear the reaper. Be the reaper. Become the reaper. In a very non-violent, civil disobedience way. Yes, the Blue Oyster Cult and Don't Fear the Reaper on Wednesday's Richie Allen Show. The time is nine minutes past the hour. Let's welcome back to the programme a terrific broadcaster, author, writer, um, all-round good guy, thisweek.org.uk, the man behind the Not the BCFM Politics Show in Bristol. It's uh, none other than Tony Gosling. Tony Gosling, welcome back to the show. How are you? Hi, Richie. Great to have you back. Hey, listen, we've got plenty of time now this hour. You mentioned video. I'm a radio guy, and after being harangued, harassed, and cajoled by my listeners for years, cameras are going into the studio on Friday, oh, and we'll be oh streaming my. video. I know it's terrible. And we'll be streaming video uh, from next week. But I'll just carry on doing the show exactly as it is. People can listen via the same you know, places, it'll still be radio, but if they want to look at a stream of it, they can. I'm not entirely thrilled about it. You don't sound thrilled about it either. No, I'm not. I mean, that's because, I, I mean, I don't know what there is to be gained from seeing you and I's ugly mug and our jaws <laughs> chomping up and down. You know, look, look, I mean, I also, having had experience in mainstream media, by media newsrooms, there was a, a very much a sort of elitist thing from the TV people. Oh, yeah, yeah, telly, man, telly. And this is where it's really at. You radio people are nowhere. Actually, uh, to me, I'm interested in hearing people's voices whilst I'm, you know, maybe pottering around in the house, doing other things, driving, whatever. Me too. I don't really care about what their faces look like. In fact, it doesn't tell me a lot, except I suppose if you're scrutinising some you know, mega important politician or whatever, then you, you actually quite like to get a bit of body language off them. But other than that, I think TV, you know, we can just junk it, basically. I think radio is a far better technology. I agree. And I do this reluctantly. I, th- th- what, what, I sleep at night because those, <laughs> those who listen to it as we're presenting it now, you and I, will continue to do it. Paul, Good. Paul Ripley, my engineer, is one of the greatest guys on planet Earth. He sold it to me by saying, look, you, you do want to keep reaching people, particularly younger people, and they're more inclined to watch or to get their content in this way through Rumble and stuff like that. And if there's any truth in that, there's no harm in it. But I'm not going to be looking at the cameras. I'm not going to be engaging with them. I'm just going to continue to do this. And I think most people will still listen through the app, through the phone, through the website, through the little player. And uh, as I listen to you on Fridays, and I do exactly that on Fridays, I respond to emails that, 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 that have arisen from the previous week's shows. I look at booking guests and I've got Tony on in the background speaking to Martin or whoever. That's radio. And I think I absorb more by doing that. Yeah, I mean, the big advantage of the uh, picture is that you can show evidence there. I mean, I think some of these uh, apps, which I really don't personally understand at all, um, I'm sure your techie people are much better at it, uh, which can, where you can present evidence and say, for example, do a screen grab or, or uh, you know, uh, where you show the screen on the video. Uh, this this is extremely useful uh, when you can talk through. And also, of course, if you've got specific interviews to play in with world leaders or whatever, then it's quite helpful to see that it really is them speaking. And, uh, you know, that in, in, in which case it's quite handy. But I just think, you know, our attention uh, is, is grabbed too much by that screen, by that flickering screen, and it kind of mesmerizes. And, and so I much prefer the whole medium of radio. It's not just because I'm ugly. No, well, you're not ugly. You're a good-looking bloke for a guy in his 60s, um, which still staggers me, really, when I see photographs of you, even recent ones. Now, um, there's lots to get into. You can take this any way you want. Listeners are delighted you're on. It's been longer than normal. We normally have you back sooner uh, than this. The 
French listeners, I actually have some listeners in France, as you do. Um, they're saying, look, Richie, what's really going on here is, and Owen has just sent a message through our website. He says, Richie, Macron wants to bring in Article 49, giving him the power to make laws without them being debated in the Senate, effectively making him a king and negating over 200 years of the Republic. F- for you, Tony, Macron trying to do this, is this further evidence that these thugs don't care anymore that we see who they really are? Well, it, it, I mean, OK, so it's similar things going on in Israel. So you've got uh, effectively you've got so-called democratically elected leaders, although Macron, you know, he's basically a merchant banker plant. He didn't have a party behind him when he ran for president, just lots and lots of money. And uh, so he managed to get in because, the, you know, the nation was divided over Marine Le Pen and, and the socialists. Uh, so I, I just think you've you've got people who are grabbing power because they're criminals. Effectively, these people are, you know, what, for example, has happened in France with the whole covid business and just effectively just shutting down the yellow vest movement, which was one of the most well mobilized you know, grassroots uh, protest movements out on the street saying, look, you know, the New World Order can take a running jump. The uh, Brussels control of France can take a run. You know, there was all this going on. I mean, brilliant stuff they were doing, like tearing down the pol- the, the, um, uh, the toll booths with, um, you know, diggers on the motorways and things like that. They were very well organised and very focused on their manifesto, which is if your listeners... Uh, and soon to be viewers haven't seen it is well worth i mean it's just a brilliant it's the french put this stuff together we kind of don't do the organizing and if we try to or often we're infiltrated and undermined like that but but i think yeah i mean they are criminals effectively and that's why they're acting like they are they've got and in fact of course there's a similar thing coming down the line in this country and, and many other countries uh they can sometimes manage to hang on to it in france he's pushed it too far i think he's deliberately done that uh it's a provocation to see, uh, you know, let's just see how they react and let's fight it day by day. They've obviously got uh, a presidential and an international banking fraternity behind them, uh, which is uh, is fighting the French people. And, you know, what amazes me is that these people have got the chutzpah to take on not only the Russian superpower, uh, but also their own populations at the same time. I mean, it just seems obvious that they're on a hiding to nothing with this. Do you think so? Because... Why, 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 why will it not come to pass that this movement in France is infiltrated just as movements here have been infiltrated in the past? And there are people listening to this now who'd say, Tony, that yellow vest, um, movement was definitely genuine and organic and it grew up out of, you know, a genuine frustration, but it was very quickly taken over again by the usual suspects who steer it in directions that are ultimately unfavourable for the people. Surely that'll happen this time in France too. Well, look, I don't know. I don't agree with that about the yellow vest because it was so much more of a, a grassroots. I mean, there were there were tens of thousands of people across the country involved in it. I mean, the, the, the French have got a uh, are they quite proud about the fact that they do engage politically? They're very politicised, and when you know there's a government which is messing them around, a lot of them will be prepared, are prepared to go out on the streets, take direct action, and civil disobedience, whatever. And um, it is imp- really, I think, impossible to completely infiltrate a group like that. Yes, they were steered. Of course, what you get is loads of agent provocateurs. It's no accident that that's a French expression yeah. that come in and try to steer things into the long grass. But, you know, what happens when you get despotic leaders? I mean, effectively, look, let's just take a step back from all this. You've got finance capitalism. Uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, these uh, massive, massive organisations. I was just having a closer look today, and it's actually BlackRock is the public b- version, Vanguard is the private version, and nobody knows. Well, some people, obviously, a handful of people know exactly who it is that owns Vanguard. Uh, but these uh, these organisations, this finance capitalist cult, uh, is has infiltrated and taken over almost all of our political parties and our political system, as well as the fourth estate, the mass media, they are very powerful within there. Obviously, they have to show uh, a kind of uh, fake exterior of balance and, you know, we're covering everything, man. Uh, but the, but on the really key issues, like 
actually allowing people to understand who's really running their countries. They don't talk about that at all. We just get the pantomime. So in in France with uh, with Macron, I I just I just see uh, this is the, we're getting to. It seems to me to getting towards an end game where they're just pushing and pushing, thinking well whatever they whatever the populations do, however well organised they are. And and I I really like I said, have a look at the yellow vest manifesto. Absolutely, really well thought out, and and almost anybody could pick that up and go into the streets with it. You know, almost anywhere in the world, and say you know this is this is the sort of stuff we're demanding from you. And nobody, as far as I can see in the UK, has done it. I mean, the Stop the War movement is beyond a joke here. It's just saying to the Russians they've got to get out of uh, Ukraine as their first demand. I mean, that isn't going to stop any war. And also, why are they having a go at the Russians? Their their job in Stop the War is to lobby here in the UK for for British policy, you know, to change British policy, for right. supporting, you know, sending DU weapons to Iraq, that sort of thing. But no, the Stop the War movement. I mean, they're, they're, all these groups, I, I think, over here seem to uh, just, you know, sweep them aside, pick up a Yellow Vest manifesto and get on with it. Do you have sympathy with people in this country who who have found that they're, that a local hotel in the village has been taken over for for the provision of services for for migrants and they find that they can't use the facilities in the hotel and these were important they ask questions about it they immediately get lumped in with you know thugs and nazis this happens all over the country and it's happening increasingly um more often look look i put my cards on the table i've said this to you a thousand times over the years the migrants are not to blame here they're not for for so many different reasons and and i had this lovely conversation last night with a listener called isabel who's half lebanese and she came on to argue for the migrants and and made a powerful case about about you know who they are and, and where they're coming from and what have you so that was very good but on the other side of that you have people in this country who see that um getting access to to, to a gp getting access to a dentist schools um, the pressures are enormous and all of a sudden we've got a couple of hundred young men and often it's, it's not always young men, but often it is and uh, they speak about it or ask questions about it and they're terrorised on social media and, and, and elsewhere, threatened with cancellation, with losing their jobs because they're racist. This is a huge issue, this. And it's getting bigger it and bigger. Uh, look, I mean, almost all of the major stories nowadays come down to globalism. And, you know, that's this whole attempt, rather pathetic, I think, people like Gary Lineker to try to uh, conflate uh, the very real problems there are with mass immigration, uh, with racism. You know, I find it, you know, re- particularly pathetic. And, and, and these people seem to sort of get away with it. I don't know how. There's no real, you know, very little anyway, proper criticism, criticism of that. The real problem is, although, you know, I, I mean, I work here with squatters here in Bristol. And one of the things we do with, you know, we're trying to house people. Every few weeks we get another, you know, case of somebody who's been evicted. Well, and what on earth is going on when when people who are coming across, being trafficked across the channel by organised crime uh, to come here and, you know, make some money and then take it back home? Most of the people, you know, certainly I, my belief is that most of them are economic migrants. They're not refugees. They may claim refugee status. And, of course, that chugs, chucks up the system. Uh, but but you know why aren't we providing housing for our own citizens? That I mean we have been paying most people here even through you know every time they buy something in a shop pretty much they're paying tax on it. The tax is going in uh, to what provide hotels for migrants. What and, and yet you've got uh, pe- people here who are just homeless and on the streets and having to go into squats and sleeping in doorways, particularly the veterans. You know, so it, it's a complete and utter double standards that I think most people are frustrated about. And this is a globalist plan. You know, this is punishment for Brexit. The uh, These uh, trips started after Brexit. And, um, you know, it seems to me pretty obvious that organised crime, which runs the EU. And by the way, um, I'd like to just say a little bit about the Dutroux scandal in Brussels. I mean, they there was I only found out recently that there were plans to build an underground city with kids that could be abused in this underground city underneath Brussels. So, I, I know very yeah, but, little about this because we've got to spend some time on this now. This is big. You you mentioned this in, in a text to me today, I think. And 
again, I don't know how you do it, to be honest. I, because I, I don't know very much about this, but you're on the ball with it. This is a massive story. Tony Gosling is our guest this week at org.uk. He's an author and broadcaster. F- at five o'clock Fridays, not the BCFM politics show, is one of the best radio uh, programs in the world at the moment. It really is. It's unmissable. So don't miss it. Five o'clock on Fridays. Uh, th- 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 do you know? It sounds, this, even this, despite the things you and I have discussed over the years, the 7th of July bombings and all the problems and all of that, to, to, to even countenance that there was plans to build a city where children could be, where they could migrate children to be abused. Take this from the top, will you? This is huge. Well, it's, it's actually a story from a few years ago uh, in the Daily Express, which I hadn't seen, which yeah. is a fascinating interview with Dutroux's lawyer. For people that don't know, uh, back around the turn of the century, there was a massive protest movement, end of the 1990s, a massive protest movement, the biggest there's ever been in Belgium, when this uh, uh, this guy, Dutroux, was discovered to have been involved in kidnapping young children in a, into a van and then trafficking or bringing them into an underground jail, basically, and, and locking them up, um, feeding them down there. Uh, and then they were there, then available to be sexually abused. Uh, and I mean, it was one of the most horrific paedophile scandals ever with the world has ever seen. Uh, but you know, the Daily Express having a chat with the, um, uh, with his lawyer uh, uncovered the fact that, so oh, just he, what it would, a lot of things that Dutroux was saying to him in confidence, uh, as part of the case, he's saying, well, it's not just me, you know, there's a whole network behind me and this kind of thing. And actually what they were planning to do was to set up a systematic pipeline of kids trafficked from not just from uh, uh, from Brussels, but from other parts of uh, that parts, uh, other parts of the world and or maybe other just other parts of Belgium uh, so that they could be abused. Now, look, I mean, Brussels is. Um, in Belgium is a bizarre place. I remember hitchhiking through there, and, and and we were hitchhiking by the side of the motorway, and suddenly someone just appeared in the bushes, flashing, you know, to the car drivers and to us, you know. It's just like, well, it's just a bit weird, yeah. But I mean, it is the headquarters of NATO, Brussels. It's also the headquarters of the EU. So you've got to ask questions about, you know, what are these institutions and what, you know, and and, and the bribery and the blackmail that's involved in politics nowadays. It almost seems as if they were trying to build a city where this could become systemic, Richie. That's the thing that I wasn't aware of. I remember the case, it was the mid-90s when this guy was caught, wasn't it? Um, it's mid to late 90s when he was first uh, picked up. He murdered several children, didn't he? Maybe maybe a lot more than that, if I've got it right. But but this whole thing about, because it makes perfect sense, and, and, and where it is, of course, you know, globally, geographically, where it is, Brussels. Yeah, where are they planning on creating... Um, you've been on this for years, haven't you? And this has gone very quiet in recent years. You know, organised paedophile rings. Um, I wanted to ask you last time this came up briefly about Carl Beach and what, what your thoughts are on Carl Beach. Is Carl Beach just a serial lawyer? Or have they destroyed his character and reputation and created the idea in the, in, 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 in the public consciousness that he's a lawyer and a fantasist because, um, because it it is going on. What 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 he talked about. What do you reckon to Carl Beach? Well, it's difficult to know about Carl, but it certainly looks to me as if that whole. Th- I mean, he uh, he did his best, I think, to tell what he knew, but it looks to me as if the authorities realised that maybe that either he had an, an iffy lawyer or that he himself wasn't all that articulate, and by attacking him and jailing him. This sends out a very, very clear message. And there's actually a lot of lawyers and police who were very concerned about the way that Beach was treated. So he's come forward with uh, with evidence. The police have then uh, used that to, to, you know, taken it further. And then he has been jailed. You know, so what yeah. message does that send to people? So, I, I mean, I think this is just really a very vicious and, and evil counter move by the abusers, Richie. That's my take on it. Yeah, you might be right. James O'Brien, the LBC broadcaster, much maligned on this programme. We take the mickey out of him a lot. Um, he took Beach pretty seriously. I'm not saying that proves anything. I, I, I think, think O'Brien's a bit of an idiot at the best of times. But um, there wasn't anything in it for O'Brien to take him seriously. And he spent quite a bit of time with him. And I think he was convinced that, you know, that Beach was, was telling the truth. I've had people on this program over the years who are convinced that children were taken aboard the morning cloud, the yacht owned by Edward Heath 
and that some of those children were never seen again, Tony? Well, yes. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is very difficult. Without a, a functioning proper justice system, it's very difficult to know yeah. you know, where all this goes. All I can say is that the BBC, um, the much maligned BBC, uh, did a brilliant documentary, an hour-long film. I think it may have been even been a second part to it. Olenka Frankel was the reporter in 2002 on Detroit, and I was particularly annoyed to find YouTube emailing me saying, oh, uh, this fashion magazine in America has got the copyright to this film you put up, uh, Mr. Gosling, and uh, unless you remove it within a week, uh, it, it, you're going to get a strike on your YouTube channel, blah, blah. So... I had to take it down. I, of course, I hate to do that. And I just said to them, well, obviously, this, this magazine doesn't own the copyright. Uh, the BBC own the copyright. Uh, and, of course, they just ignore that. Uh, so there is no real ap appeal process. This is on my Peter Berenius channel. And um, so what I've been doing <laughs> a lot, quite a few days, the last few days, is just getting the MP4 of that um, 2002 video about to true and just getting it out there to as many places as possible. This, that what they're trying to do is they're isolating down to maybe only one or two sources, very important um, bits of information like this, uh, and then trying to completely kill it off. The idea is that, oh, what can he do? Well, I mean, every time I see this kind of censorship going on, I just try and replicate it and multiply it and get it out there as much as possible because the, although it's an incredibly disturbing documentary, what 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 Alenka did is she did had a fantastic series of interviews with one of the young girls that was involved in it all and, and knew, it, knew it, the whole thing from the inside out. She was in the process of recovery. She was very articulate, very brave. And, uh, you know, she was a survivor. And uh, and that is the, the those are the people we need to hear from. The BBC did that back in those days. And, you know, so this documentary, I would thoroughly recommend people go and search it out. It's from the Correspondence series in 2002 and the reporters, Alenka Frankel. But an absolutely mind blowing bit, bit of documentary making about the centre of the United States of Europe and the centre of NATO right underneath those headquarters. Right underneath, it's incredible, really, and I, I'd just forgotten most of this stuff, you know, and I didn't really know about the city and that, but that's fascinating. Faisal says, the true is a story that isn't talked about enough, it's the real EU Pizzagate. God, we remember Pizzagate and those claims in um, in the US. But I, I don't know if you want to, if, 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 I'm looking at the clock, there's, there's so much still we want to get through before before 10 to 7, but... Um, Comparable. Yeah, I mean, well, what, what, what were your thoughts on Pizzagate? Oh, look, I mean, it was a cover up. It was a very well organized cover up of something that really was most definitely happening. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of this stuff is becoming it's almost like it's uh, the it proverbial is hitting the fan for years and years and years of crookery. What seems to be going on is the uh, these I mean, really diseased criminals, evil people are slowly but surely painting themselves into a corner. And uh, particularly when looking at the banking crisis that's been going on, I, I, I hope it's all right if I say something about that with these various banks going down. Yeah, this is big. I mean, yeah, we got to talk about this. This is this is credit default swaps are the only things keeping these. But ba that's basically insurance on bonds when a bank just announces to its bondholders, "Sorry, those bonds are not are not, are not going to never going to be paid." And although that you lent us all that money, you're not going to get it back. So then these credit default swaps are used as insurance. Now they are becoming <laughs> most impossible for new to, for people to new to take out new ones. You know because there's a real nervousness that that, that these bonds are going to go down. Uh, and so these are the sort of merchant banks we're talking about. Well, you, we used to call them back in the 1970s, anyway, 80s, 90, uh, 70s, merchant banks, which is, you know, your, your Rothschilds, your Goldman Sachs, these kinds of people nowadays. Um, and it, it seems to me what's going on is I wouldn't worry too much about banks collapsing now because Rishi Sunak from Goldman Sachs is in the driving seat. They're, they're unlikely to crash it on his watch. I would say we're looking at a sort of pre-Blair type situation right now where i mean this is just really is just guesswork but it's my kind of uh you know political copper's instinct if you want is that they they know that starmer's coming in soon next year uh maybe even the end of this year we're not quite sure but uh and when he does he is the most easy person he'll basically read any script that's put in front of him to manipulate uh the labor party are very very disciplined now they've got rid of all the real labor mps the ones that support palestine or most of them anyway and jeremy corbyn 
And uh, we've got this sort of robotic Team B that will come in and they'll crash the economy on them. You know, uh, and then they'll come back. You know, the A team will come back. Right. I was, I'm actually quoting John Stockwell, the former CIA colonel who was uh, we had on our show last Friday, although he's uh, he's either very elderly or passed away now. He he was talking about the U.S. system as the A team. Of course, we can see loads of uh, examples in Britain everywhere you look where it's uh, it, the U.S. system is being implemented here in Bristol. We've got a U.S. star mayor who's like basically Al Capone. He can do what he wants. And, uh, you know, that that's the sort of thing that they're trying to implement here in Britain now. So I don't th- I think that's uh, we can wait a while before the bank's r- crash really does happen. But they'll make sure, like they did on Gordon Brown, that they fa- that they crash it on a Labour government and uh, uh, and that the, the, they take the rap for it all. And that Labour government will advance the green agenda, the the climate change agenda too, right? Massively. And of course, if Labour were in charge during COVID, we would have had horrific, strict, like uh, New Zealand style measures here. You know, these kinds of, I mean, oh, ridiculous uh, and utterly absurd. But, you know, this is where, where we're at now. It's like uh, intelligent people are being silenced and muzzled and shut up by a bunch of morons. That's that's the attitude there seems to be uh, with, with um, you know, this, the sort of agenda that we saw during COVID. And it was almost like a trial run uh, for the lunatics have taken over the asylum, Richie. So you think this this crash will will happen on Labour's watch, partly because of Sunak's connections to Goldman Sachs, and when this crash eventually happens, this will precede the hard rollout of the digital pound, right? Is that is that yeah. what we expect? Yeah, the central bank digital currencies. Yeah. They've quite clearly got a program to enslave us all using money. I mean, I can remember being over in, uh, gosh, was it Hong Kong or Singapore? Gosh, can't remember now. I thought it was uh, Hong Kong chatting with forest, some foreign correspondents from the big US newspapers out there and uh, this is a few years ago and they're saying well what they do in Singapore is as soon as there's any political opposition then they just uh, you know they see how much they have a look see how much money they've got and take it off them you know through the courts or, or by whatever means and of course that's going on over here now it's the power of money what happens is the uh, you know the the classes that might be about to resist or are resisting they're looked at closely and their source of finance a source of income is destroyed by whatever means whether it's switching off a bank account uh, whether it's uh, prosecuting somebody so that they lose all their savings in a court case uh, they will f- find uh, money as the weapon and that's why i mean i remember chatting with david southwell years ago the author of uh, Secrets and Lies, which is well worth a look, and also The History of Organised Crime, two books of his which are superb. And he's saying, well, look, this is the way gangsters operate. They love to have poor people and poverty. They just want that. It's like the third world, Richie. They just want as much poverty as possible so people are forced into organised crime. Tony Gosling is our guest this week at Org. UK, the, not the BCFM politics show every Friday at five o'clock. Um, Charles is in Germany. Meeting his cousins, he said. <laughs> Meeting his cousins and addressing the. It's not the Bundestag there, is it? It is, is it? Um, addressing the, the Parliament there. What do we read into that? Does it mean anything? Symbolically, well, does it mean anything? He, look, he's going home, isn't he? <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> there is that. Well, says I mean, says know, the man it, who. What you say about Charles? I mean, really, the most bizarre. I mean, I've interviewed um, the U.S. writer Tim Cohen about. Charles is the author of a book, The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea, which looks at the just symbolic connections between uh, the coat of arms of uh, the the Prince of Wales and, and King Charles and the biblical descriptions of the Antichrist. It's quite an interesting study. I mean, I'm not saying anything. You know, I, th- I just think we need to be aware that there might be some connections between, you know, organised evil and the British royal family. Quite clearly that Edward VIII was a Nazi. Uh, and uh, and as you said to me when we when the Queen died, Richie, you're absolutely right. You know there was a plot uh, to kill. Uh, was it? Oh gosh, is it uh, George V? George V, uh, yeah, to yeah, get yeah. him out of the way. Uh, and he was killed by Edward, almost certainly, uh, because he was languishing. Edward dis- and, and he was looking at, at skipping Edward and going straight to, the, you know, George the George the Sixth. 
uh, he was he was almost certainly murdered, you know, by his own son because his son wanted to take over. Now, maybe there's echoes with the Queen and, and Prince Charles with that. Who knows? But there's certainly a rather nasty Nazi strand within the British royal family when, you know, you've got Edward VIII over in Lisbon. By the way, Bilderberg's in Lisbon this year, which I'm hoping to go to in May. Uh, a bit, but but uh, Edward VIII was over in Lisbon uh, telling the German ambassador there, look, just start, please start bombing London. And with a bit of bombing, that they'll, they'll that will that will bring them to the negotiating table, and that was the beginning right. of the blitz. The so yeah. these people, are, you know, we have to be a little bit, you know, careful with them, especially when. And what's going on in Germany is unbelievable, isn't it? Really, what with Nord Stream. So the Americans have blown up a German Russian project. Allegedly, to bring cheap according fuel. according to the Russians, they have, but there isn't any proof no, of it's that. It's not just the Russians, Richie. No. Look, well, the I, Danes, mean, the I think world, I think the, the Danes... whole world knows who did it. And, and Cy Hirsch has absolutely opened this up. Uh, it's the Americans that did it. And they did it because they are now selling. I mean, it's part of the destruction, the uh, industrial smashing of Europe, the whole of Europe. And, you know, the idea that the Germans uh, will accept the Americans coming in and destroying this project. Are you, you, are you seriously saying you don't think Cy Hirsch is right and someone else blew up the Nord Stream 2? Not at all. I was just doing my, my BBC thing here. <laughs> Hey, listen, before you talk more about Nord Stream, um, of course the Americans did it. Before you talk more about Nord Stream, do, did you tell me a moment ago that somebody has written a book in which it is claimed or alleged that Charles might be the Antichrist? But yeah, this is Tim Cohen. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I've interviewed him several times. I, he, he seems to follow what uh, the British royal family do closer than most Brits ever do. And he picks out all the interesting things that, that Charles gets up to. Like, for example, having a massive statue of himself built in Brazil, where uh, there's a picture of Charles with these massive angel's wings. Uh, You're uh, kidding painting. me. Is, no. that, is that real? So, well, you just look it up. It's, it's on it's a BBC did a whole article about it. Uh, the wow. the saviour of the world, it's got written at the bottom. All ah, right, this is to do with his environmental interests and stuff. Right, I get you. Well, is he? Yeah, but I mean, look at what he's, he's just signed it, signed off this amazing new law. What's it called? The genetic technology. Well done, Tony. The big brain on Tony Gosling. The big brain on Tony Gosling. I knew you'd have seen this. That's right. This, this, this guy. Eating bill. Yeah. He, 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 for, for many years, he campaigned against genetically modifying, uh, crops and food. And now the guy's all for it. He signed, well, he, he's, he's basically given his seal of approval to the government's bill. Uh, to it, gene editing, yeah. Well, this is crazy tech, isn't it? Yeah. Really? I mean, this is, and also it's Bilderberg, by the way. I mean, uh, I actually managed to amazingly meet Emmanuel Charpentier, who's a French woman who uh, is uh, the patent holder of a lot of this CRISPR technology, which is exactly what this is, the gene splicing business. And uh, so they're saying, oh, it's just a kind of another form of selective breeding. No, 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 no. You, what you're doing is you are thinking of yourself as gods yeah you're creating new creatures you're saying well this part of this creature is no good we're going to just snip it out and get rid of it and we're going to take a bit from another creature and put it in there so the, you know the idea that uh, this is even necessary on planet earth is an uh, well it's disgusting i mean i find this whole idea of trying to play around with genes rather than look at humanity and uh, sort out the problems of the poor uh, it seems almost the opposite's going on. So we, we're trying to create more and more and more. These people are anyway, more and more poor people and m massive divisions in society uh, with the rollout of privatization of land, of everything, really, everything that people need to live. Uh, and on the other hand, we're being told, well, uh, you know, we're, what we're doing is we're trying to create this wonderful e egalitarian planet. It's just, I mean, what they're, all they're doing is they're trying to enslave us. And they're also, they are so arrogant that they uh, themselves believe that they can do anything they want. I mean, this is all fits in with this, of course, with this transhumanism and the yeah. uh, transhumanist agenda, actually an occult agenda. Uh, which is uh, Human 2.0. This is uh, Yuval Noah Harari and Nick Land, my old school friend. The stuff they're into, the dark enlightenment and um, accelerationism. And, and just, to, just to finish on accelerationism, because this is where I think it all comes together. You're looking at all these different crises, a financial crisis, a COVID crisis. Uh, well, I mean, you know, Ukraine, we've got a war crisis. Uh, we've got a migrant crisis, and yet all the solutions to these various crises 
are all making things worse. So why might that be? Well, yeah, isn't that, it's an interesting pattern that's developing, and that's where you get into accelerationism. The idea is really looking at Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, create the biggest MF of a crisis you possibly can, uh, uh, what you might call a cluster crisis, politely, and, uh, and then you can change the world in almost whichever way you want. So they are going for the, I think, for the big time here. Uh, a system of slavery and almost a kind of new religion with them as the gods. Tell me this about this book about Charles, which I'm going to order after the programme. <laughs> no, I am. I really am. Um, did the gentleman who wrote it, did the author, did did he make any comment on allegations made by citizens of Kamloops in British Columbia? You know the allegations I'm referring to, right? No, I don't. No, no, I don't. It is alleged that in the 1950s, a, a party which included the, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen, and other dignitaries took some children from a, not an orphanage, but a boarding school. Kids who, yeah, I think they might have been kids without families, took them out for the afternoon, and some of the children never returned. They were hunted for sport and stuff. Now, I, I've interviewed people about this over the years, and you'll be proud of me. I, I gave them a proper chasing. You know, I said, come on, for for Jesus' sake, you know. Um, but no, there was one chap in particular called Kevin something or other. And he sent me a lot of documentation. And there are still survivors or descendants of those uh, children or relatives who, are, who, who still demand answers. Now, some of the more sensational people have made all manner of allegations about the late Queen and the late Duke of Edinburgh. I don't know about that, but, you know, that they were involved. But that's a story that um, keeps coming up over the years. You know, Kamloops, I think, British Columbia, and children were taken out as kind of a benevolent thing to do, and quite a few children never came back, Tony, apparently. Well, look, uh, I just don't know enough about that. Me neither. Um, Only what I heard, yeah. Um, yeah, but, I mean, I can tell you that he killed his wife. I mean, obviously, he didn't do it himself, but uh, Diana was most definitely assassinated, and she was proving very inconvenient. I mean, you know, th this this guy is not the sort of guy you want to have in charge, really. I don't know if you know, but <clears throat> but um, Justin Walker has put out, a, I think, a very important, you know, little letter he sent to the people involved in the coronation in May, saying, well, look, how is this? This guy is obviously trying to be both the sovereign of Britain and also the king of the world. I mean, and I, uh, that's paraphrasing him. You know, he's saying he want, he's, he's pushing all this World Economic Forum agenda, which is a hostile takeover of the United Nations, as well as trying to say he's working in Britain's own interests. Now, uh, it's quite, quite, quite obviously not both. Both can't be true. And but what he's trying to do, obviously, Charlie, is fudge it. Yeah. Uh, so it's important that there's some sort of clarity, I think, about the coronation. Is who who is this guy actually working for, or is he just some sort of charlatan who's infiltrating, you know, the 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 idea of British sovereignty? Are uh, you know, particularly after Brexit, in order to just, I mean, it was interesting, wasn't it? The the I don't know if you saw the Telegraph at the weekend was saying that uh, Charles's uh, mission into um, uh, France, which didn't, didn't take place, there was an a, 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 there was an opportunity being taken there to try and uh, sort out some of the problems that Brexit had been brought. Well, this isn't Charles's job. No, yeah? it isn't. No, I'm, it's I'm, nothing to do with him. The other thing with Northern Ireland, as I'm sure you know, is th is this whole you know stitch up of the protocol to make it so that it's just going to be uh no longer part it's, you know northern ireland is becoming much more part of the eu than it is of the uk and this isn't actually you know i think people just deserve to have a, a vote on that um rather than a, you know some kind of stitch up this again king charles has uh, been very much involved in those in fact it's called the windsor framework the uh the new arrangement. Now, his mum would never have been doing any of this, Richie. It, it, she would take take a step back and get let the politicians get. She quite rightly saw um, the the sovereign's role, the head of state's role, as someone who basically would go out and just go to coffee shops and play, um, go to open charity events and things like that, and let the government get on with it, and only intervene if there was some sort of crisis to try and sort things out. Uh, you know, as say, for example, uh, you know, a war or whatever, you know, she might have a role in that. But uh, the idea that, 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 that he's, I mean, he really does, he's interfering. Is in a book about him, I think it was a film called The Meddling Prince. A lot of 
the critical documentaries about King Charles also have disappeared or when he was prince off the internet, particularly with his involvement with the, the uh, diner assassination. In fact, he tried to get a brilliant film completely banned from Channel 4, uh, which showed that the photographers weren't responsible for uh, the speeding Mercedes and that it was probably uh, some high-powered motorbike possibly driven by SAS or other special forces that forced the car to accelerate into the Alma Tunnel. So there's lots and lots of basic stuff that Charles is, you know, he, t- he, he you get a cross on many, many boxes with him. I don't, hang uh, on a second, hang on. particularly interfering I, in politics. I don't, um, should not be doing that I don't, I don't share Tony's appraisal of the late Queen. I, I never have done, but I'm not going to get into that now. But look, this is not tradition. There's something... I've argued this not with you, but with um, with um, listeners over the years. The MP or the member of the Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Assembly, they must swear by Almighty God to be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Um, it's not tradition. It's not ceremonial. They're not just cuddly heads of state, a, a throwback to bygone days. These people really are running the show. Yeah, I think they are. Uh, yeah. or at least, I think, I don't know about the Queen. I really do. I mean, I honestly think she spent most of her reign, uh, you know, going and patting horses and things like that. She had a lot of wealth, which was being managed for her. But I think as an individual, she did see herself as a sort of grandma of the nation, you know, like the Queen Mum or something. I don't think she was getting too involved in politics, Uh, Although, having spoken to someone who was very close to her, he said she's extremely sharp, and I'm sure she was. Um, So, uh, yeah, but Charles is extremely, he's totally, it's like chalk and cheese. Uh, You know, he is much more interventionist. He's duplicitous. He's trying to pretend that he's pro-organic, and yet he's, you know, that he's doing the opposite with the genetics, as we've just heard. So, very, very, very different character. And, you know, the idea that, Camilla is, you know, God, I mean, you know, she's what Diana was, was beautiful. She really was as an individual. She was the sort of person that we needed uh, in order to reset the royal family. And of course, that's why she had to go. We're just about out of time. I want to give a, a quick mention to the program again. It's uh, not the BCFM politics show every Friday. Tony and a cast of thousands. Terrific radio. It really is good. This week at org.uk. Go to Bilderberg.org. We'll get a quick word on Bilderberg in 90 seconds from me before we wrap it today because we're rapidly running out of time. Tony's written some books. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Well, um, I just want to say a few positive things because Andrew Bridges done such an amazing job. What a guy. And uh, he's been on again, and and these various uh, Tory MPs, there is no opposition. Um, These are the opposition to Bilderberg and to the globalists. Uh, You know, we were talking a bit about homelessness. I'm absolutely, as as many Irish people are aware, I'm sure you are too, of the role of the Irish Land League in the build-up to the toppling of the British Empire in Ireland and, you know, very, very close to home uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, land issues are still incredibly important. Uh, we all need a piece of land. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights guarantees everybody land. That means you don't have to pay for it. You just get it. And any country that says that its own people cannot be, because basically what's going on is everybody who is working uh, with mortgages, etc., even with rents, is afraid of being about to lose their home. Uh, we've just got to take that away. If we make Ill- uh, uh, eviction illegal, uh, then then this would just help a lot of people and their families to do what they want to do rather than be coerced into a job they hate. And we're doing something about this May Day Bank Holiday, a uh, little group I'm involved with called The Land Is Ours. We're d- doing a, a squat down in Dartmoor where they're trying to stop wild camping down there. Uh, so near two bridges, I think it's basically going to be uh, near somewhere near a... Um, uh, sort of uh, hitchhike ride from two bridges or else there is a bus actually uh, so we're going to do a kind of weekend camp down there to talk and about land rights in the uk how everyone needs somewhere to live and how to, to make it happen and uh, get away of the power of money because if we get these basic essentials for free things like water etc uh, then we don't we're not coerced into some awful job that we hate and working for some boss uh, that's just using us to fulfill their own twisted dreams That's brilliantly said. Imagine the cheek of them to think they have the right to tell you you can't camp 
in the wild. You can't camp by a stream. You can't. <laughs> you can't. I mean, where do they get their balls, these thugs, to tell people? that? Well, he's, pri- he's the guy's from a private equity firm, Richie, and he's an incomer. And the locals are, uh, 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 you know, the locals are very supportive of all the different institutions that do do wild camping there, including the army. Listen, I want to give a quick mention, and we are out of time then. Um, support Tony Gosling and the radio show. Uh, pick up a copy of The Siege of Heaven or The Traders of Arnhem. You'll find them online. Terrific books. Bilderberg.org. Thisweek.org.uk. No doubt we'll be chatting in April. Thanks again for your time today, pal. Brilliant conversation. Well, well thank you, Richie, and uh, God bless to all your listeners. Thank you, Tony. The great Tony Gosling, live from Bristol, Friday, 5 o'clock. Be there. It really is a sensational radio show. Uh, Tony in a cast of thousands, thisweek.org.uk, not the BCFM politics show. You can't keep them down.